Yeah. Okay. So, can you tell me the difference between ID and class in STM? ID and what? Class. Class. Okay. I haven't heard of class, uh, but ID is something like integrated development environment where you can, like, I mean, of course, apart from writing code, you can, you know, do some testing and perform debugging and all that stuff. And if uh, if you are talking specifically, I think if it is about terminal and uh, like uh, normal uh, integrated development environment like VS Code, I would say uh, the major difference it would have is, you know, all the integrated support like extensions, plugins, and putting in the um, um, like putting in the other features like uh, what do you say that you know, GitHub uh, integration and all that. So majorly, I would say it is extended environment. However, a normal terminal or a normal shell is something where you can execute the code. Uh, you can of course write a code, but maybe it is not that intuitive, and then you can run all that uh, code there. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's my understanding among the two. Okay. So do you know local storage? Yes. Uh, can you insert some value in local storage using your? Sure. Let me. Uh, should I just go to browser? No, uh, in code. Okay, okay, okay. You want me to insert a, uh, some value yes. in my uh, system using local storage? Yes, yes. yes. Okay, and uh, which language you want me to do this in? Uh, JavaScript. All right. Okay, so I'll just do a import fs from the inbuilt library, which is fs, and then what I'll do is let's say const data equal to uh, key, and then let's say value, and then after that I'll just uh, oops, after that I'll just do fs dot write file sync. I don't want to make it asynchronous, so and then here I think I'll just add the path so. Uh, I think it would be process dot current working directory cwd uh, cwd and then maybe example dot json and then the data I need to stringify it so json dot stringify data and yeah I think this should work uh, should I run this yes okay uh, cannot use import statement okay let me make it mjs instead of mod because it is expecting it to be require syntax so let me try to rerun it oh sorry i need to change the name again here so it is a modular js file so yeah i think now it has been created okay cool so do you know promises in javascript yeah, yeah i know can can you create one promise sure uh, resolve after 3 second okay sure so let's say uh, get data after 3 seconds is equal to uh, an arrow function which will be new promise and then resolve where uh, set timeout um, uh, timeout would be yeah I think resolve data let's say this and uh, where is the second parameter I think here so timeout would be maybe three seconds so 3000 milliseconds and if I do get data after three seconds so let's uh, maybe have const uh, I think I, 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 rather than resolving it I'll just log it here so let's say console.log promise result just to identify that the execution is complete and yeah I think this should be it so basically what I'm doing is I'm creating a new promise and uh, setting the timeout and after three seconds I will resolve it with the data so yeah I think let's uh, should I run this uh, can you create one more promise sure uh, resolve after two seconds okay resolve after two seconds all right I'll just take this boilerplate and then set timeout resolve data promise resolved after two seconds and let me make this as two and instead of this and line number uh, two can you add one console log uh console log where yeah line number two line number two okay yeah sure yeah, add a console log uh, add some text yeah okay Function. and line number uh, 21 add one more console log okay console log function execution maybe i mean synchronous function execution completed so let me just add here sync function execution then yeah on line number 11 add one set time log. Okay, set timeout. Resolve. Resolve uh, after two seconds. Okay. And create one more set timeout. Resolve after zero seconds. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Add some control log here. All right. Uh, global set timeout two seconds. And this would be global set timeout zero seconds. Yeah. And should okay. I call so this can, one also? Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Can you tell me the output now? Sure. So first of all, uh, okay, coming from line one, this would definitely be the first one. So let me just add. So this would be the okay. Let me just add a comment here uh, at the top. So uh, the first would be function execution started. After that, what will we see? We will go to okay. This is a function definition, so nothing would come up here. Now this is an asynchronous function, so it will be come into the it will come into the call stack, but it won't execute. Similarly, this won't also execute. Then it will come here. It will trigger this function, which is uh, get geo data after three seconds. Uh, sorry, get data after three seconds. So it will again. So let me just quickly have a call stack. So in my call stack, what I have initially is uh, first it would be this particular function. So global set timeout, global set timeout after two seconds. Uh, then I'll have global set timeout after zero seconds. So global set timeout after zero seconds. So these two are in my call stack. And then it will take this guy. So it is 
get uh, get data after three seconds. So basically, since it's an asynchronous function, so uh, again, this would be two second delay. This would be zero second, and this would be three seconds. So let me just uh, promise resolve. Let me just keep this guy here. So this would be uh, three second delay. So these are the call stack, and then after that, there is one more which is two second. Again, this would also resolve. So let me keep it here. So this guy would be at here, and this will run after two seconds. So yeah. And then finally, uh, again, this is synchronous, so this should directly come up here. So this will be, I mean, this is not an asynchronous method, so it will directly come here. OK, so we are done with asynchronous. Now coming to call stack, <coughs> uh, main thread will run. It will look, uh, two second is not done, so it will go to the next one. So it will see zero second is done, so it will print out this guy. So I think it would be global set timeout zero seconds next. And after that, uh, so this is done. Now it will go to the next guy. Three second is also not done. Two second is also um, okay. This would be so. This is also going to trigger after two seconds. But since this is uh, taking uh, the above priority, so very likely this should get printed. Um, uh, this one, uh, wait, uh, yeah, this one because it is at the top. So mostly, um, not very sure, but I think yeah, this would be the order. And then after this, so this guy is done. Now three second thing again would wait, and then it will print this guy. And after, oops, did I not copy it? Let me just copy it again. Yeah. So after this, this is also gone. So finally, we have the final call stack, which is three second promise. And yeah, so yeah, I think initially the two synchronous statements are done, then zero second timeout, then two second timeout, then finally again two second, and at the end we will have the third second. Yeah, I think this would be the log. Okay, can you run that? Sure. Uh, node example not. Yeah, let me just uh, resize this. Yeah. So we have function execution started, execution done, zero seconds, global set timer two seconds, after two seconds, and then promise resolve. Yeah. Okay. Mm, okay. So do you know promise dot all? Promise dot. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I know promise dot all. Promise dot. Uh, can you please explain? That? Yeah. Sorry. What? Can you please explain? That? Sure, sure. Promise dot all. Promise dot all is basically let's say you have n number of requests that are independent of each other. Let's say I have a dashboard. Uh, dashboard shows me the data of some client, and parallelly I have some let's say notification which is totally independent. So in those cases, what I want to do is I want to you know uh, not choke into waiting for one request. Let's say if I had some uh, data that is coming from the dashboard and pulling it to the notification to get some more data. In that cases, these two promises would be dependent. So what I am ideally saying is that when I have multiple promises, promise one and promise two that are independent, then I can execute them at parallel in a way that these two are independent. They would be run together. I mean at at the same time, they would be sent. And these promises, uh, whichever executes the least, I mean, uh, takes the maximum time. Let's say uh, this promise takes two seconds. Uh, this promise takes one second. So in this case, uh, the, prom uh, the overall execution time would be still two seconds, uh, rather than you know making these requests sequentially, in which it will take three seconds. So basically, it will complete the first promise and then go on. So when I do something like promise dot all, uh, and then I let's say have these promises as promise one and promise two. So it will make the, these promises parallelly. It will wait for the promise which takes the most time, and then whatever is the result data, I get the data, and then I can I mean do whatever I want to do with that data. Okay, what about promise.race? So the promise.race is, let's say you have similar situation, but in this case, uh, you want to make sure, I mean, you want to get the promise which resolves the for, for, I mean, fastest. So in that case, uh, if I do it like this, then in this case, I'll get the data from both the promises. But if I use something like promise.race, then I'll get that, uh, whichever comes first, it will take that. So in this case, it will be promise one, and then it will resolve, and then it won't uh, proceed further to, you know, uh, wait for the data from the promise to, or uh, I mean, execute the further steps. Cool. Yeah. So, so do you know async await? Async await, yeah, I know it. Mm, can you create one function? Sure, sure. Okay, so uh, let me just clear this up. Uh, let's say we have a function get data from API, and I'll make it asynchronous so that JavaScript knows that this is asynchronous. And then let's say I make a fetch call, so const data equal to fetch. And of course, fetch I would need to install node fetch. So let's have a mm, the set timeout. So you know, what I'll do is um, set timeout, and uh, let's say getting data from Google or something getting data from api and after set timeout uh, uh, let's say it takes two seconds so um, yeah uh, let me actually make this also promise so it would be more clear so i have it like this uh, new promise resolve and then all this so resolve after two seconds so let's say resolve i requested for some data data is equal to uh, abc which is getting from the server and i'm not sure why is it complaining about indentation so we have it here uh, uh, okay i think i missed it here so let me add this yeah so now this will give me some data from api now let me call it in another asynchronous function so display log the data something like that again this would also be asynchronous and after this i would have const result equal to await which will block the execution get data from api and then i'll do console log result equal to result 
So this will take the data and then I can call it in the main function. So basically something like this. So yeah, I mean, this is asynchronous. It will resolve after two seconds. It will wait and block the execution. And once the it is complete, then it will log the result. I think this, this would be one example of asynchronous, I mean, async await. Can you run the? Sure. Uh, okay, I'm getting some error. Promise is not defined. Okay, it should be promise and not promise. Let me run it again. Yeah, so it takes two seconds and then it gives me the result. Okay, here you are resolving results, right? In front of resolve, can you reject that uh, request? Sure. Uh, in front of resolve, you mean after this? No. Uh, in the line number 22, you added resolve, right? Okay, okay. You mean to change it with reject? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So in this case, I'll have to try catch this one. So basically what I'll do is I'll try and see if the result is resolved. And if it is not resolved, I'll catch the error. And then I can log, you know, error occurred while fetching the data, something like this. And then I can just uh, keep the error message or error trace back, whatever I want. Uh, but yeah, like error message would be a little bit more cleaner. So yeah, I can then do it like this. Okay, can you explain try catch and the final number? Sure. Uh, so try catch basically try is you know whatever is the expected code that you want to execute and what is the expected behavior that you want to see. You make a call from API, do some uh, component changes, refresh the state, whatever you want to do, you do it there. But let's say something unexpected happens, then you want to catch that with the catch block. Anything, any unexpected scenario, whether it be network request, whether it be server error, whether it be uh, internet connection, whatever it can be, that you catch into the catch block. And then in case if it fails, then you want to make sure that uh, the app doesn't crash. And for that, you use uh, you know to display some error message and all. So there you use this, and uh, yeah, I mean then you can do everything. And let's say there is a finally block basically which means is that irrespective of it executed the try or the catch i want to execute this piece of code for sure so let's say you want to do some kind of cleanup or any you know resetting state let's say if it fails or if it happens whatever you want to reset then in all these cases uh, try would happen uh, either if, even if try or catch whatever happens this guy would definitely get executed okay yeah okay so let's uh, okay so do you know indexes in database indexes uh, i mean i know indexes but Practically, I have never implemented them on my own. I just know as a theory what exactly they are like. Uh, you know, you can index a particular column. You can index a particular. Uh, yeah, mostly it is about indexing a column for better database performances, and you know, having a unique identifier. So uh, which could be kind of sorted, or which could be kind of uh, you know, uh, maybe I mean arranged in such a way that the uh, search the lookup operations or any such operations become faster. So that is my overall understanding. But I've never implemented indexes on my own for anything. Okay. So any experience in caching, like Redis? Yeah, yeah, I have experience in Redis, uh, Redis, and what else I have experience in? Um, I have some front-end caching experience, like uh, using the React query and all that stuff. And then uh, mostly, I think yeah, it's Redis only. Okay. Okay. So, uh, do you know middlewares? Middlewares, yeah, yeah, I know middlewares. Can you explain? Sure. Okay. So middlewares is like you know, let's say you have n number of routes. You have route one. Let's say uh, you have a specific route for authentications. Then you have routes for logging in user. Uh, then you have routes for let's say it's it's a bank transaction application. So you have route for logging in. Uh, then you have routes to perform transactions. So all these kind of routes. So perform transaction and so on. So when you say login, so login should be open to every user. Like let's say if I have my web application hosted at example.com, so every user should be access, you know accessing my API route to log in and authenticate themselves. Like let's say if I restrict it to X Y Z users, then not not end of not all the end users could use it. But let's say I want to perform a transaction. In that case, I want to make sure that okay this person is authenticated to perform a transaction like let's say x wants to perform a transaction from their account let's say they want to transfer 200 dollars to uh, uh, y, y's account so for all these cases i want to make sure that you know they are authenticated or authorized users and for these use cases we will have a request interception meaning that i have an endpoint which says let's say perform transactions which would be intercepted uh, and ensure that okay uh, like i can have perform transaction check balances whatever there could be n number of endpoints so uh, instead of rewriting that logic of interception again and again like i want to check if user is valid so if i i, I if there was no middleware then i'll have to write it again and again like here then like let's say if there are 10 endpoints, I have to write them again and again. Now, what middleware will do is it will take uh, a common functionality that is, uh, let's say I have a function which checks the user validity using their tokens, identification token, cookies, whatever. So let's say validate user. So I'll have something like this, validate user. This would be the middleware which would intercept all these requests as a higher order function. And then it will see if the request is, I mean, user is valid. Then only it will let to move ahead. Otherwise, it will you know return a 404 response. Like if user is not valid, uh, not 404, actually 401. If user is not valid, then it will just return it from here. In that way, these API endpoints uh, remain secure. Otherwise, if it is, if the user is valid, then it will you know forward the request to their respective endpoints, and then the next operations could be performed. So in okay, yeah, cool, cool, no, fine. So can you tell me a uh, get post then put call? Can you explain? Uh, get. Uh, sorry, I, I missed the last part. So get call, post call, then put call. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. 
So the get call is mostly for reading the data. I mean, of course, it is not like restricted, but you can, of course, uh, it's generally for, you know, whenever you want to read the data, you can pass the parameters uh, using query parameters, ABC, and then you can do some write operations and all, but majorly it is for posting, uh, reading the data. Uh, post is for mutation purposes. Like if you want to modify the data, you have JSON body and all that stuff. You want to uh, make changes to the body and all, I mean, make changes to the database request something and all that. So that for that case, you use post request and put is to kind of modify, but in a way that it is already existing. So let's say I want to ex uh, modify an existing API with some, my username, or I want to change request of my email. So I'll just, you know, go to user ID, go some specific user and perform the modification. For, the, for that cases, it is put and for you know, creating a new data, create request kind of thing, it is generally preferred as post and get is for reading. And of course, these are not, I would say, very hardcore rules. You can, of course, make design APIs in such a way that uh, it can perform create operation through get call as well. But ideally, this is the use case like uh, in get, you read the data, in post, you create the data and in put, you update the data. Okay. Any, uh, do you know unit testing? Yes, I know unit testing. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I do unit testing in, mm, majorly I know it in JavaScript environment only. I, I also did some unit testing in Java in environment Scala and all, but yeah, mostly I'm familiar with the JavaScript environment of unit testing. Okay, so can you open uh, any React project? Sure, uh, let me open it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yep, uh, I've just opened a React project. Mm -hmm. Okay, so create uh, two different components. Okay. So child and uh, uh, parent component. Just pass the value from child to parent, parent to child. Okay, okay. So let me create demo component here. Mm. 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 I'm not sure why it's taking so much time. Yeah, okay. So let me create a parent component, parent.tsx. And then I'll use a normal <coughs> boilerplate. Yeah. So this would be my parent component. And for now, I'll remove this. And then let's have a child component. Child.tsx. Again, the boilerplate. Child component. Let's say name property I'm taking from parent. Name of type string. So child. And let's have this name here. And I want to destructure it here as well. So I'll go here and uh, instead of div, okay, let's have div here and let's have the child component also. So react.fragment and take it here. And then I'll use the child component, which I just created now and pass in name as ABC. Mm, yeah, I think, why is it? Okay, I need to import this, import child, uh, import child from child. And mm, yeah, I think this is, uh, and let me just route it so that we can see somewhere. So it would be parent and parent would be import parent from components demo parent. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think, uh, should I spin up the dev server? Yes. Sir. All right. Okay. So it's running now. Let me go to localhost. Hmm. And I think I need to go to demo route because, yeah. Yeah, uh, it's rendered. Mm, okay, so create uh, uh, two different input box, addition of two numbers, just uh, create two input box, then. Okay, sure. Add some front different. Okay, so I'll have input. Uh, placeholder will be, oh, sorry, input first number and then input second number and then uh, numbers or let's have it individually. First number set first number equal to react dot u state and then second second number set second number equal to react dot u state and here I'll have <coughs> value equal to first number in the first one and i need to change this to second number and then on change handler so let's have that as well on change uh so we will have e event and then set first number e dot target dot value and i need to change it to string uh, numbers and uh, oops i think let's have it as number and this one also initially let's have it as zero Okay, and uh, and I also need to specify the type so that it does not accept strings. Number 
Mm, yeah, so now what I have input and then let's have a button. Uh, add two numbers and then we will have a paragraph maybe. Sum is, um, sum is first number plus second number or but then it will reflect on the in live. Uh, uh, am I supposed to reflect it like live or should I have a button and only when I press the button then it should uh, uh, show the result? Sorry, sorry. Um, uh, anything fine. Uh, okay, can... okay, fine. But then I'll just keep it as first number plus second number. And let's remove this. So yeah, I think this should be it. And I need to set the second number instead of first. And I think this looks good. So we have first number, second number, and then the sum is first number plus second number. Yeah. Mm, yeah, it's there. Yeah, can you change it? Sure. So if I do two, if I do 24, 245, and then if I do, let's say, of wait, 45 or something like that. Yeah. OK, uh, so do you know uh, okay, how many years in Re experience in React? Uh, I would say uh, 2.5 years majorly in React. OK, OK, cool. So do you know Redux? Redux yeah. yeah, I can know you, Redux. Can you explain? Yeah, sure. So Redux is basically a state management tool. Like, you know, let's say we have n number of components and we want to pass the data among themselves. And instead of prop drilling, like the way I'm doing right now is I'm passing child name. And let's say there is child to even child. There are a lot of childs and, you know, I have to do prop drilling from the top to bottom. I'll keep on passing this. And then I, let's say I want to update a uh, top, top level data. Then again, I have to do all this. So what Redux basically does is it provides you a store, which is like a global state. And I mean, of course, it depends. You can make it as uh, uh, specific to a specific component also. But basically, it is a global state. And then it talks to your entire virtual DOM, which is React. And then you can, you know, uh, talk back and forth. You can dispatch, and uh, basically you can create, uh, update the existing entries, and uh, cre uh, create or modify the new entries, whatever is there in state, and all that stuff. So it's uh, ideally it's just a state management tool, and yeah, I mean it facilitates all that process. Okay, 